series uh, called Platform of the Prophets, in which we're looking at uh, some of the minor prophets in the Old Testament. We're going to be looking at about six of those in the next few weeks. Last week we started with somebody um, that maybe not many of you knew so well. That was Hosea. And this week we are going to talk about Amos. And we're talking about the prophet's messages, which is God's message, uh, in light of the upcoming election. You know, we get to hear the commercials, hundreds and hundreds of them every day, and we get to hear what people are shouting. This, this is what we need to do to solve the problems in our country. And I don't know about you, but sometimes I wonder, well, how, how close is that? To what the Bible is saying. And so we're trying to bring out some of those concepts in there. So the scripture text is uh, going to be uh, up on the screen there in about one second. And I'd like you to just read that out loud. This is from the book of Amos. Let's read it together. But let justice flow like water and righteousness like an unfailing stream. What a beautiful, beautiful verse. I mean, you can get a, get a feeling for that picture, but justice flow like water, and you get the stream, and it's going to continue to flow. Justice, justice, justice. Well, what is justice in the eyes of our current politicians? I mean, it doesn't matter what side of the aisle that they're on. Some people think justice is we've got to eliminate all sorts of corruption that is in our, our Washington, D.C. That's justice. Another person may say, if we just give everybody a $1,000 check every month, that's justice. Another person may say, if we just get the guns out of everybody's hands in America, that's justice. People have all sorts of uh, statements about what they feel that justice is. I wonder what, how God would define social justice. I'm not suggesting that God would have nothing to say about some of the things that I've just said. But we look at some of the unbelievably serious issues going on, especially in the world, we look at that there's more slavery in the world today than there ever has been in the history of humanity, particularly as it is, uh, as it is done in sex trafficking. Going on all over the world in our country. I never hear any mention of that. It's interesting. What does Jesus continue to talk about in the scripture before the oppressed, the marginalized? And how do we provide justice for them? So we're going to look at this. We're going to look at what Amos had to say at this time. And uh, I'd encourage you with your own Bible reading, let's, you know, to, to, to read through the book of Amos. And sometimes these minor prophets are a little bit difficult to read, and they don't always make sense. But uh, there are going to be some things that are going to just run off the page and, and run right into your soul. Who is Amos? Amos, he's a farmer. He's a farmer from a city, little city. They're all little cities, basically, at that time. Uh, from Tekoa, a small town in Judah, about 10 miles south of Jerusalem. Tekoa. In addition to being a sheep herder, he was, he also tended sycamore trees. You heard of sycamore trees before, right? Zacchaeus was a wee little man who climbed up to the sycamore tree. When we were in Israel, I bought sycamore nuts. I was very excited about them because they tasted good. It tasted good. They were really good. And my wife broke my big sycamore bubble. She said, they're not even from sycamore trees. My wife has to Google everything. It says they're peanuts. They have special coating on them. But sorry, Jonathan, everything I told you was a lie. Yeah. Anyway, they're very good sycamore trees. Many sycamore trees actually grow dates and figs. That's not what we're talking about today. Amos grew up in Judah. Remember those two nations of Israel got uh, separated Israel to the north and Judah to the south. Well, here Amos grew up in the south, yet God told him. He would be prophesying in the north. See, God spoke. God revealed himself to Amos. And a person like Amos, he's a farmer. Just imagine what a typical farmer looks like today. So he's out doing his things, and God tells him, Amos, I've got some things that I need you to do. It's not as though Amos grew up and he told his parents, I want to go to public school. And one day, go and say very unpopular things to a group of people that don't want to hear them. No, God revealed himself to Amos and said, you're going to go and you're going to bring my word north of here into Israel. And the moment that Amos received that word from the Lord, no doubt he thought, oh, this is going to be tough. Of which it would be tough. Because, of course, 
Amos would be perceived as an outsider, and sometimes people don't handle outsiders too well. And he was going to bring to them a difficult word that they probably wouldn't want to hear. Well, Amos was a contemporary of Hosea, okay? They were both prophesying at basically the same time, the one we talked about last week. And they were prophesying during the reign of King Jeroboam the II, who was a very evil king. And as we said last week, what had happened to Israel at this time is there was a great deal of economic prosperity and political stability. And sometimes prosperity and stability, they don't drive people to give praise to the Lord for what they're experiencing, but it literally contributed to their spiritual decline because sometimes people, they like to take credit for their prosperity and credit for their stability, and they became their own mini gods and moved far away from the God of the Bible. And so what we see going on at this time is a tremendous amount of social injustice, the rich exploiting the poor, the powerful preying on the weak. Morality meant little to nothing. And so as the prophecy began that what Amos was going to bring to the people, uh, the people of Israel, as he started talking about all these other nations in the first chapter, they probably thought, well, look, Isn't it amazing sometimes how we love to think that we're better than somebody else? I mean, there's somebody always worse than us, right? As an individual, there's somebody always who's going to behave worse than us. And as a church, there's churches that are probably not nearly as good as ours, right? And we sort of grade ourselves according to other people or other churches, but in fact, there's only one standard that the Bible gives us, and whose standard is that? It's God's standard. And so, yes. There is going to be prophecies that are given out for other places as well. And so in chapter 1, what Amos starts to do is he starts going through a a, a litany of these different places that we see on the map. So Damascus, the capital of Syria, Israel had always struggled with them. They were really bad. You know, Damascus was always seeking to brutalize the people of Israel. And then there's Gaza, which is a city uh, of the Philistines. And the Philistines, they would capture the people of God, the people of Israel, and what they would do is they would deport them to a place called Edom. And Edom would use them and sell them as slaves. And there's a prophecy going against them. And then there's this place called Tyre, which is a city in Lebanon. And they had enjoyed, Israel had enjoyed peace with Tyre during the time of David and during the time of Solomon. But now Tyre, they also would capture people from Israel and send them over to Edom to become slaves. There's a prophecy against them. And then there's Edom. As a matter of fact, the next three, they're actually, their history goes back and they, and they're blood brothers of Israel. Edom. Remember, Edom, Edom comes from a guy by the name of Esau. Remember Jacob and Esau? Jacob and Esau from the Old Testament. Jacob, who God called Jacob, Israel. Well, there's a long backstory to this that we don't have time to talk about this morning, but Edom is always wanting to fight with Israel. And they're continually doing that. And then there's Ammon. Ammon was evil. They were evil. They would literally kill unborn babies of those living in Gilead. What would they do? They would cut them out of their mothers. Tremendously brutal people. It's hard not to look at that and see what's happening now today. How about Moab? Moab had desecrated the bones of Edom. These nations were all evil in so many ways. And I'm sure as Amos was, was going up and, and, and starting to say this prophecy, the people of Israel were going, yeah, yeah, they're bad, they're bad, they're bad. And then after he got double dose, they said what Amos started to talk about was Judah. Now he's starting to get close to home. Judah. Well, Amos, these were his own people. And they had different crimes. They were more spiritual crimes in nature. 
they had forsaken the law. They were following other gods. And each generation would fall deeper and deeper into sin. And they would prophesy that God was going to deal with Judah. So by now, Israel had to be feeling really good. Man, they'd gone after all these other places. And we're going to stand up for you. And then, of course, David tried to talk to the Israel. And he talked about the judgment that was going to fall upon them. And I'm sure it was an ouch moment for Israel. They would be dealt with harshly because of their many sins. Because they oppressed the weak. They cared for their own personal gain. Sexual sin abounded in the nation. The people celebrated the fruit of their wickedness in pagan temples. They took this prosperity that they had and they spent it on themselves in very um, elaborate ways. Some of you have been to Las Vegas. My wife and I have been to Las Vegas uh, more than a few times as we come back and forth from uh, the West Coast. Las Vegas was never a place that we would go to gamble because we don't gamble. We have some mighty funny buffets there. It used to be cheap to go there. We'd take our kids to go swimming in spring break. But the thing that I always got a kick out of when you walk through the casinos, it used to be the people that actually put coins in the slot machines. Now they have cards. And people don't want to lose their cards because they have money on them, so they, they attach them to their clothes. And then they have this card, they're attached to it. And they just put them in there to get the money. And I thought, what a unbelievably vivid picture of how we get sold out to something and literally sucking the life out of us. That's what sin does to us. We literally get attached to the people of Israel at this time. They were attached. They get more money and they spend it on themselves because they wanted more money. They wanted more material things. And they spent it in, their, in the pagan temples because that's how we got it in the first place. And people are still doing that in America today. Spend more and more and more and more. And just what Jesus said, don't store up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust destroy, but store up for yourself treasures in heaven. But yet we're attached to this stuff. And because of that, what happens is the poor get neglected. And those people that are so important to Jesus. So there was going to be a time of punishment that was going to come. See, God reminded them that, you know, I brought you out of Egypt. I brought you to a promised land. And what did you do? You haven't shown the gratefulness that you should be showing to me. As a matter of fact, I sent prophets to you. Prophets now like Amos, but other prophets. And when those prophets come with the words that you don't want to hear, what you do is you persecute them. You want to drive them out of town. And sometimes you even want to kill them. But I'm actually trying to bring you back to me. There's going to be punishment that's going to come. They weren't going to draw back. And then when we get to chapter 5 in Amos, verses 21 to 23, I put that little thing in your outline that says, Lord, you are pleased with all the churchy things we do, right? See, folks, we're still involved in a lot of churchy things. I mean, you're here this morning. This is a churchy thing. And I'm not saying it's bad for you to be here, but it depends on why you're here. Did you come here this morning because truly you wanted to worship together with this gathered community? And you wanted to worship together with this gathered community and stand and sing songs and, 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 and receive the word this morning. And be transformed through the powerful work of the Holy Spirit in the church. Or did you come because you set a New Year's resolution? We are going to go to church at least 30 times this year. And you check it off. These other people just go through the churchy things. Well, look what it says in chapter 5. These are strong words. I hate, I despise your peace. This is backpacking. I can't stand the stench of your solemn assemblies. Even if you offer me your burnt offerings and grain offerings, I will not accept them. I have no regard for your fellowship offerings of fattened cattle. Take away from me the noise of your songs. I will not listen to the music of your harps. Whoa. These are strong words coming from God. So they're going through the motions. They remember what it means to be religious after all. And so we'll do these things and God's going to be okay with us. And so what does God say to the prophet Amos? I hate them. 
I despise them. And when you use words like that, you're understanding what God's meaning. The people of Israel were probably surprised. They were probably amazed when Amos said these things. See, they told themselves, they were living in this own personal bubble, but they told themselves that they were honoring God and pleasing Him by their observance of the feast. The assemblies, and God was offended by their religious ceremonialism, disconnected from the heart. And then they were providing justice for other people. They were ignoring other people. And here's a strong word that comes from the book of Amos. I'm concerned. If you become a hearer thinking you're doing what God wants you to do, and you ignore people out there, and you don't take care of people out there, and you don't come to the aid of people who need the help that God has equipped you to give to them, then you're not working here. That's what the book of Amos is saying. Matter of fact, he goes so far as to say, I despise that you're here. I despise that you go through all these rituals, and you're not actually going out there and being the church that I called you to be. Those are strong words. And so, it's a bold man thing. And it reminds me of the passage that Jesus even talked about in Matthew 5. In Matthew 5, Jesus says this, Therefore, if you bring your gift to the altar, and then remember that your brother has something against you, leave your gift there before the altar and go your way. First, be reconciled to your brother, and then come and offer your gift. It's a beautiful passage that Jesus talks about. He's so concerned that we are living together in the way that Christ's followers are supposed to live. So in the New Testament, Jesus is saying, it's so important that you've reconciled with your brothers. Don't come to me. Don't think that you can continue to have this great relationship with me, and yet you're living in discord with others. That you have others out there that you say, I will never forgive you. That's what Jesus is saying in the New Testament. It ties right in here with Amos. God was making it very clear. If you're not living the way I asked you to do, don't think that these churches that you said you would do shall pass. And then at the end of that very section where he's talking about, I hate this and I despise this, that's where the verse that we read a few moments came in. But let justice flow like water and righteousness like an unfailing stream. What a picture. Because this is this is justice rolling like water, okay? This is this is this is gushing water that's coming out. This isn't just a little tiny stream that if it gets hot one day, which it did very much, that it's gonna evaporate. No, this is going to be justice. This is this is gonna be compassion unleashing like rapids coming down from a mountaintop. Where they're gushing and they have signs there, don't get in this because you can grow. This gushing water that's coming down, let justice flow like that. That's what God wants us to be a part of. So what does social justice look like? We hear that word, and I hear both in positive senses and in negative senses. And the important thing when we talk about social justice is this, that the word gospel for the Christian always has to be in that equation. Social justice in and of itself isn't necessarily Christian unless we have the gospel in it. Well, of course, throughout the Bible, and I put a little list of your outline, the Bible is very clear. We're, there's certain things God said to, to do with the foreigners, the widows, and the orphans. And compassion is treated for those who are marginalized. Jesus continually showed compassion and concern for those who were marginalized or rejected. The early church was there to help people who had, were experiencing things like famine. And then James, the half-brother of Jesus, he was very clear in his book in the New Testament, hey, faith without works is dead, folks. You can't live in your faith and then leave your poor brother out there and basically say, what should we do? So, let's go to this. How do we actually live differently? So the book of Amos is filled with these prophecies. And of course, we know that for Israel, they were going to be taken captive by these Syrians. As a matter of fact, the prophets were so explicit with what was going to happen. Assyria was such a brutal nation. Nineveh, which we're going to talk about Jonah next week, Nineveh was like the war capital of the universe at that time. 
that when Assyria came and captured a nation at this time, it was so brutal things that they would do. Check it out. They would gather up the people and they would line them up. And they would connect the line and they put fish up. And they connect the fish up right under your nose. And then the next person to connect the fish up to your nose. And they line you all up and they go all you off in the captivity. And so when the word of Syria starts getting mentioned in this equation, the best in judgment that's going to be upon you, that is serious business. Judgment was going to come out of Israel because they had been warned, they had been warned, they had been warned, they had been warned. God was very patient. That's all God was saying. You've been warned and warned and warned and warned. What is it that we're supposed to do? How do we live differently? Well, first of all, we've got to capture the prophetic Holy Spirit. The word prophecy is used all over the place now that in our Christian culture, and sometimes it becomes a, a little bit of a, a flashpoint. What's a prophetic voice? See, I'm not going to try to be Amos because I'm not Amos. And you probably aren't either. So when you talk about a prophetic voice, does it mean foretelling? People often think that a prophet is somebody who is foretelling things that are going to come. Well, there is some of that that happens through the prophets of the Bible, but it's also foretelling. A gift of prophecy is saying what's going to happen now as well. And how do we know? Well, we know from the scriptures that are right in front of us. I don't have to dream of something or make something up. I just go to the Word of God. It's foretelling. A, a prophet lives in the now. See, one of the things that a church like ours has probably been good at for many, 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 many years, a long time before I came, a church like this is often good at doctrine and theology. It's a good doctrine, good theology. We're a reformed church. Okay? We have a good history. It comes out of the Reformation way back in 1517. Traveled to the Netherlands with John Calvin. Came over on one of the first boats that came to America. This is a strong theology, and I would agree with that wholeheartedly. However, and we have a strong theology, but not a strong practice. There's a gap in there. And that prophetic voice needs to come out now. It needs to come out and say, Take this strong biblical knowledge, this strong biblical theology, and put it into practice. Because faith without works is dead. That's where that prophetic voice needs to come out and say those things. Like with Amos, they were going through rituals. They thought they were doing the right thing, but God despised it. Amos cried out to them to address that. Our voice must reflect God's heart. We can't ignore the marginalized in the world. We can't ignore people of color, people who don't look like us, people who don't have a culture like us, people who don't have a religion like us. We can't ignore those people. We can't ignore the person who doesn't live according to how we think that they should live. We can't simply drive to church, have our eyes focused on church and what we do at church, and pass by all these people and think, that we don't have any responsibility to address those needs as well. God desires that we get out there and address these needs. We have to reclaim a prophetic voice. We've got to get busy in this. And then there's the gospel. Social justice can often leave out the gospel. I see it in many places. Churches that are involved in social justice and you don't see anything of Jesus, anything of the gospel anywhere around. And, you know, they say the lines that, well, we're going to live off the gospel and if necessary, we're going to use the word. It's a bad quote. It's a bad quote. I think if St. Francis of Assisi was, was here today and say, you're using the quote that way. He'd say, no, that's not my point. It's always two things that are going to go in there. Their actions and their words. And we've got to do both. Share the good news of the gospel. What's the good news of the gospel? Folks, it's this. We are sinners. We are sinners. We are in need of grace. We have a God who loves us. He sent his son. He died, he rose, and he reigns in heaven. He's going to come back again. When you call on the name of the Lord, you will be saved. This is the gospel. This needs to be communicated. It's not social justice or the gospel. It's both. And at the center of the social gospel, this, this, I mean, the social justice that we do with the gospel is Jesus at the very center of it. He's the center of the message. 
He is the ultimate when it comes to practicing social justice. See, sometimes people think that, that, that Jesus is only out there preaching the gospel. And other people say, well, he's out there just practicing the gospel. Well, neither one of those statements captures this fully. Jesus was doing both. He was speaking it. He was practicing it. It's both. And so that's what we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be proclaiming it, and we're supposed to be practicing it. If all we're doing is talking, if all we're ever doing is going to a Bible study, if all we're ever doing is hanging out with our friends that we like, then I would submit that we're not really practicing the gospel. We're becoming big heads. Sometimes fat heads. But we're not living out what God has called us to do. We have to step out of our circles. We have to step out. And this is why even as a church, as we become a loving church, it's not just a matter of being a loving church for those people who walk into the door, but it's learning to be loving to go out there and to love and to embrace. That's why I'll move that loving people do with the kingdom of God. But if all we do is hang out with the people that we like, we're never going to get there. Hmm. Look at what Jesus said in Luke 4. I love this. I love this picture. He walks into the synagogue. This is Jesus. In verse 17, he says, The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was given to him, and the Lord of the scroll he found the place where it was written. This is what he read. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, to set free the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. And then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. And the eyes of every one of the synagogue were fixed on him. He began by saying to them, Today, as you listen, this scripture has been fulfilled. What a scene. You've got to see this on video when they get to heaven. Because basically, what Jesus was looking at them, you know, you know what I just read? I knew it. I knew it. You've read these words from Isaiah many times. I am. This is what I've come to do. And now this is what you're supposed to do in the world today. Exactly what it says today. Preach the good news. Set the captives free. Jesus was going to be engaged in recovering people's sight and freeing the oppressed. And so, folks, as a church, we've got to be biblically informed on the issues. And this is the time of year that people get informed by listening to political commercials. No! That's not how you get informed. You know, sometimes politicians are just like vacuum cleaners. One end they suck in dirt, and the other end they blow out hot air, right? I mean, really, it doesn't matter what side of the aisle that you're on. And if we think we're going to be informed that way, we're sorely mistaken. It's the Bible which is going to get us informed. We need to be biblically informed of things like abortion, racism, immigration, helping the poor, war, guns, etc. Biblically informed. Not by reading a bunch of political brochures. Otherwise, what happens is we just begin shouting at each other, and the shouting happens based upon whether you're on this side of the aisle or on this side of the aisle. We've got to start talking about the Scriptures. Because here's the big question that I have for you. What if both sides are wrong? Hmm. I think there's a good chance that on many issues, both sides are wrong. But neither side is lining up with the Scriptures. So what kind of action are we going to take? You know, a few weeks ago, we went through, uh, the last Sunday of 2019, we went through the book of Jude, the whole book, from one Sunday. And remember what the theme of that book was? Contend for the faith. Contend for the faith. And what Jude was saying is you've got to contend for the faith. Why? Because false teaching is going to invade the church. It's going to invade the church. So he's speaking this 2,000 years ago, and what we've seen for 2,000 years is false teaching invading the church. You've got to be ready to contend for the true faith. So what does that look like? See, if somebody comes into your midst, and this will happen, this happens all the time. See, because when churches make stands on things according to the scriptures, they'll, they'll be somebody who says, Well, all I want, all I, all I know is this, that God is love. God is love. And when people say God is love, sometimes churches feel like, Well, but there's nothing more I can say, right? Because God is love. Well, no, there's a little bit more in here than that. Are you ready to contend for the faith? Are you ready to talk about that? 
there's not actually a standard, because there's actually going to be judgment that's going to come. God is absolutely love, but that doesn't mean He accepts all things, all behaviors, anybody gets to do what they want. But sometimes Christians, they're not ready to contend for the faith, and they go, oh, yeah, I guess it is love. Remember what Elijah was ready to do when he contended for the faith? There were there people out there, these prophets of Baal, this is our God, it's better than you, and he went, come on, game on, let's do it. Let's go up there, let's find out. Now, he went a little bit further, which I don't suggest that you do. He actually killed 400 false prophets. But he's ready to contend for the faith. Don't you talk that way against God. When people come into your midst and question the truth, the inerrancy, whether this is literal, whether this is a real book, whether this is an authority for us, when they question those things, are you ready to contend for the faith or are you ready to fold? Yeah, I guess it just is a book. No, it's more than that. This is what we ask these elders and deacons to lead this call today. You believe that this is the Bible, that this is the authority, that this is the rule of life, that this church needs to be held to the standard and that you're going to help do that. Are we ready to contend for the faith? And so when it comes to action, folks, what it means is that you see a need fill it. Sometimes it's poor people in our church. Sometimes it's poor people in this town. Sometimes it's because a natural disaster has happened 5,000 miles from us. Because we will always remember that faith with our works is what? Dead. Why do we need to bring hope, folks? If we practice these things, if we truly live out, the things that we're supposed to be doing, that David was bringing a prophecy against God's people because they weren't doing it. But if we do do it, what we will do is we'll bring hope to the world. The church in this world needs to be the greatest first responders that are out there because when there are needs, they need to be addressed. The church must lead the way. That's why in, in, in our mission, when we talk about following Jesus, and building community and unleashing compassion. That unleashing compassion that's, that's inspired by this verse from Amos, that it'll flow, it'll flow like this, this body of water just gushing out. We must be aggressive as individuals, as family, as a church to unleash compassion. We sent a group to them, to Tyler, a few people, to Tyler and Mark. And we're going to kind of go there and go explore. How can, we, how can we serve over here? How can we bring people from first responders to power over to serve in Thailand? I'm so excited about that. We support missionaries in various parts of the earth. So grateful for that. We're always supposed to ask the question as individuals, as families, as a church, how can we help? How can we help? And so we live off the words of Romans chapter 15, verse 13. All that can be there with me. Now may the God of hope Fill you with all joy and peace as you believe, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Let's pray, Father, thank you for hope that we can have because of Jesus Christ. Lord, when we become selfish, when we become, when we are just focused on ourselves, we literally are robbing people of hope around us because you've actually placed us here to bring the good news of Jesus Christ to others so that they can know this very hope. I pray, Lord, that wherever selfishness exists, that we would lay that down at the cross and that we can speak to each other. Generous with our money, generous with our time, generous with our resources. Knowing that the promises that await us in heaven are incredible. So whatever inconvenience is that we feel that we sometimes endure in this life, we'll just stand as a thing to the Lord Jesus Christ. Help us, Lord, to be a part of this gushing river of unceasing compassion, unceasing justice in a world that so desperately needs it. Sometimes there may be things that come out of Des Moines or Washington, D.C. that will help, and we thank you for that. Lord, may we never be dependent on what they're going to do. May we seek to ask the question right here in your church and be the radiant bride that you call us to be. And in so doing, we will help bring hope to a world that desperately needs it. And in so doing, we will declare your unbelievable greatness. In Jesus Christ's name we pray.